Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. This is Maha Bailey from the American University in Cairo. Um, and I've got some folks with me here. And we're going to try a liberating structure and development called Thick Greetings, which you can use either in introductory situations or just as a warm up at the beginning of a class, maybe even at the end of a class, I think. Um, and it, it's it's a slower, thicker, deliberate opportunity for people to introduce themselves to new people they've never met before. Um, and I tried it recently and I really, really liked it. Um, and it, there are several elements about it that I like. I mean, the first element is you're going to put people in groups of three in breakout rooms. Um, and in those groups of three, each person would have four to five minutes uninterrupted to speak with the others, responding to one or two of the prompts in the chat. Uh, either we share them in the chat, but I'm going to share them on slides. That's easier. But putting them on the chat is helpful because when people go into the breakout rooms, then they'll have access to the chat. Or mm -hmm. you can just give them the slides so that they can keep um, the prompts in front of them as well. And just mm -hmm. the important thing is to tell them they have to take up the full four to five minutes. So if they finish early, they can go to another prompt or just expand further on it. And one of the interesting things is you'll realize that you you will have something to say if you're given the time to say it usually. Um, and just people just need to decide who, who goes first, you know, and that's it. So the prompt, what I like about this is also you have options of which prompt to answer. So in terms of safety, you know, some people, a question about disappointment will be really traumatic for them to talk about, for example, uh, but one about humility will be easy. So, you know, it's just let the person choose how they want to introduce themselves. If you just put people in rooms to introduce themselves, they may fumble, they may not know what to talk about, and they may not go very deep. And I think all of these let you go on a certain level of depth. Um, and so I'm going to keep these up for a little bit. I've shown them to folks who are with me. I have here with me Laura, Mia, Autumn, and Rebecca. They've already looked at these prompts and taken some time with them. If you're doing this live, give people time or send them the prompts even ahead of time if they're your students. You can email them the prompts and tell them, we're going to talk about this today, and you're going to have five minutes to talk about whichever of these you're comfortable with. So that if someone needs time to sort of outline what they want to say, they could do that. Okay, so can you guys decide amongst yourselves who wants to go first? I know some of you have already chosen what you wanted to talk about, so. I can go. Okay. All right, shall I take these off the, the screen for now? And then we can share the screen again if someone wants to see it when it's their turn. Okay, go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> okay, if you take it off the screen, it'll be like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, and I, I had started with one and I jumped to another, so I might jump between the two of them. Um, can I see the screen for a second? And I will tell you the two is <laughs> that I can actually, um, just as a, a remind myself here. And so I had said heresy, which is what truth, sorry, just, um, what is the truth you're questioning? Um, and community, where do you belong? And how do you foster belonging? And I actually see a connection between the two. Um, so that's kind of sort of an interesting thing, because when I looked at truth, um, the thing that I'm questioning is the relationship between be, between being in person and being virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and what does it mean as a community um, that is virtual versus a community that's in person? And so I see this interesting challenge and it's a challenge that comes up. You can take the screen off now if you want. Um, somebody needs to time me, by the way. <laughs> um, one of the challenges is is um, the um, here goes the brainwave. Sorry, um, right? Um, the the idea of this hybrid model that keeps popping up, right? Where you know we know how to do things when everybody's virtual, and we know how to do things when everybody's in person. But when you have that half and half model where you have half of either your students or in my case, half of my community um, in person and half of my community virtual, how do I make an even, um, you know, how do I create an equitable experience for both? Um, and I think in some ways COVID has helped us 
because those that were only ever doing the in-person now have a better sense of what it means to be at the other end of things <laughs> and to be virtual. So where previously we might have done all day workshops because it made sense for the people that were traveling that were in person, but made absolutely no sense for the people that were virtual. They now understand that being on Zoom for more than two hours is just not a fun experience for anybody. <laughs> is sort of an interesting thing. So I think that that, that um, it's sort of the, the thing I'm questioning is whether we can and how we might. So I guess the heresy is sort of that we have, it has to be one or the other, right? It has to be either all in person or all online. Um, and sort of the community part is is really how do you build that community? How do you how do you build that community in an equitable fashion? Um, because part of like we did this before COVID, and what was happening really is everybody that was virtual got to know each other really well, and people that were face to face got to know each other really well. Um, but then you were in essence creating two communities, um, and there wasn't you know there was some mixing, but there wasn't to the ex same extent that there is with the intermixing now that we're doing social things all online and now that everything is all online. And so I can sort of, I, I can see this as the super challenge for classroom teachers um, who are having to work in this hybrid model. Um, and how do you, how do you, how, yeah, how do you survive in that? Like how, how do you build that classroom community without creating a whole inequitable us versus them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have to, to just share because Maha just brought up her VC mug. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm done. I think that, that I spoke for. You have two minutes left. I, oh my goodness, I still have time. I you. Give you her asked four minutes. Time you. Give her four minutes, so one minute only. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let's do <laughs> Cause, four instead Because I'm not sure. Um, okay, so um, I'll jump onto disappointment. Have you lost something that you miss and what is it? Um, I think the biggest thing, because I recently made a move and the biggest thing I lost in that move was the Ability to say goodbye to my friends with a hug. Um, because when I left, it was just the beginning of the height of COVID. Um, and so there was no physical contact. And a lot of my friends were in a very er, semi high risk area um, health wise that it just, you couldn't. And so um, very few of them I even saw those that I did was like dropping things off and stepping back five feet or so. so I have a lot of um interesting um socially distant selfies of, <laughs> of myself, my friends as we were leaving because we did a lot of socially distant selfies mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. is going to be an interesting meme for 2020 <laughs> a socially distant selfie um so that I think for me um would be probably one of the biggest recent losses is, is yeah, that. Um, and certainly one of the biggest gains in coming here and the community and the belonging was just the welcoming of the people where we arrived um, and the ability to hug because we were in a safe area where restrictions after quarantining, right? After safely quarantining for 14 days, be, we were able to actually physically connect. Um, and that, <clears throat> understanding that how much of that I had lost and how long it took me to just feel comfortable doing it again. And I think about how, you know, we're going back into that time of disconnection and how long and how hard it's going to take people to learn how to physically reconnect. You're at time. Okay. Well, those were the two questions I was going to respond to also, actually. So maybe I'll go ahead and start because um, the community and the community building, um, I'm someone who's, who's taught online for a long time and I, I love building communities online. You know, I've, it, the, the question was about where do you feel at home? And it sounds weird to say it or where do you feel like you belong? But I feel like I belong 
online, which is a kind of weird thing to say because online didn't even exist when I was growing up. And so as a kid, I felt like I really didn't belong and I didn't really have a lot of friends and I just read books all the time. And then here comes the internet, you know, so it's been sad for me in a sense to, to see so many people who don't feel like they belong online and find it hard to connect and haven't found that sense of community online. Cause that's what I've found and I have for years, but then I'm also part of a, uh, classes that are, you know, these mini communities online. And so that question about uh, giving something up, losing something, you know, as I think about stopping teaching, I really worry about losing that connection with the students. Like my professional connections, they're all online. You know, I'm not going to have that sense of loss that some faculty members do who are really connected, say, to their department. And so not being part of their department anymore, those water cooler conversations, that's going to be hard for them. Whereas for me, all my professional colleagues are online. Like if I didn't say I was quitting my job, no one would even know really because, you know, there you all are and we interact the way we do without a department or a school or a job title. But with the students, I'm really going to miss that, I think. And um, that's why I'm just so excited that you all find this microfiction stuff, something that you think your students would like. And that makes me think, well, I can connect with other students out there, maybe indirectly, or, you know, find people who want to be part of like impromptu learning experiences that can happen once again online. You know, you don't need a school or curriculum or a classroom to learn together. So those are some of my thoughts. I have no idea how much time I just took up, but that's what I'm thinking. Do I have another minute? Should I keep going? You do. You have about... Oh, very exciting. And so, you know, I just like doing the Zoom is so much fun when it's a small group like this. And that's been a real learning experience for me too, because I never did any kind of synchronous video stuff. And in a sense, I, I wish I had known more about this kind of interaction online before COVID because I didn't do these kinds of things and I didn't know about them before COVID. I really didn't start Zooming until COVID. And so that's another kind of loss. When you finish something, you think about all the things you accomplished, but then you think about all the things you, you could have done differently. And I guess that's, since I haven't finished a big thing in a while, like ending a career or something, I haven't really thought about that. Like if you could do things differently, it's not even regret. It's more just sort of, well, like we were talking about revising writing, you know, if you could revise your life, that would really be something, right? But you you can't do that. So I guess you just have to take the lessons learned and think about what you write next with your life and try to do it differently that next time maybe. So I don't know if that's one of those liberating structures, but uh, losing and then gaining, right? So there are new things to do, even though I'm leaving the old things behind. So who's next? I could go, although I, I'm quite um, <laughs> I'm quite unsure about the four minute time thing because I just had one little thought that wasn't very formulated, but let me go and just jump in. So I'm scrolling back to the questions and I think um, I was drawn to the heresy question, but then in the end, I think I'm gonna choose um, processing. And the question is, what attitudes and activities help you through transitions in your life? So, I just caught myself the other night speaking with my MA thesis students because um, we had a difficulty ending the class emotionally. I mean, meaning we all felt loss because we're online and there's no hugs, there's no, um, half of them are graduating now in the December time and then the other half in the spring. And we've talked a lot about hoping for the graduation in the spring and those who, graduate in the fall would then be walking in the spring but that's all a you know pipe dream right when we don't know what's going to happen and it's it's highly likely that graduation might not be something we can pull off like meaning institutionally there won't be a graduation due to covid and so what i realized in this whole conversation is that people need rituals to move through transitions in life and how important rituals are And I spoke to them a lot about the fact that I'm a kind of 
um, like many people, I don't think I'm unique in this way, but that it might not be apparent unless you know me, that I'm a paradoxical person and that in many ways I'm very progressive minded and, and they know about that. You know, They know about my orientation around social justice and a kind of progressive outlook about what needs to happen for all of us. But I'm also a very traditional person. I'm a person of faith and I've moved through my own life through very specific rituals of life transition. And that includes a marriage and it includes like um, Catholic traditions, like my first Holy Communion and you know things like this. And of course, graduation is just as big as all of those other things that have marked moments in my life. I think there is something important about having everyone in a community gather together and acknowledge the significance of a certain moment and to do that through ritual, through, um, you know, through invocation, through um, the formality of garb, like what we dress in and, and how we um, celebrate together, that makes us understand that we've stepped from one experience in our lives into another with promise, you know, even, and I just want to acknowledge that funerals fall into this category as well, mm -hmm. like the acknowledgement of loss as well. So I don't know quite what I'm trying to say other than I, I really miss the importance of ritualization in, in the movement of our lives, moving forward, you know, and I'm not, I'm not the one suffering as much as others. I, I keep feeling this feeling of how much desperation there is out in the world and how blessed I am. But even in this like small acknowledgement and reflection, I feel almost a little guilty for saying, you know, that I feel these things when I haven't had to face um, a significant loss um, the way I know some of you have. And uh, I mean, in the mo time of COVID specifically and not being able to go through those rituals. And even the thought of the graduation of my MA thesis students um, makes me feel something like yearning for ritual that isn't quite impossible. So yeah, I look like I'm about to cry because part of my heart feels that way. Ma, you're right, absolutely right. But, um, you know, I, I just guess I'm trying to reflect that, uh, reflect on the idea that rituals are important. That's that's what I want to talk about. So I don't know if I made it to the four minutes. The four minutes made me feel a little un uneasy. But well, two minutes. It's good enough, right, guys? I was doing <laughs> five minutes, but I, you okay, made it right on time. Perfect. <laughs> you were perfect. <laughs> it's like. And by the way, I I, I almost well, started I crying when I was thinking about you about, specifically about Laura. Thank you. So um, I guess I'm next. I'll start my little timer for myself. Um, I actually chose uh, disintegration. And what uh, stuck out to me on that was um, the first question that they kind of have, or it's actually a statement, or no, it is a question, I guess. Uh, what are you like when you're messy? And um, I'm so messy right now. <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys saw, there's a, uh, there's a uh, cover of The New Yorker that was out this month, I believe. And um, it's a drawing and it's a woman on Zoom and like everything right around, like you can see like right in front of her, she's like in professional dress, like from here up, but everything, her whole room is a mess. Like there's Amazon boxes on the floor. There's all this stuff. And I mean, that's, that's totally me. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is my life right now, right? Like I have this nice kind of, uh, you know, this much <laughs> my world is neat and tidy but um <laughs> everything around me is just kind of chaos and it's funny about once a week about once a week I go through and I kind of tidy it all up and I clean it all up and I make it all sort of uh you know uh more sane maybe but I keep kind of falling back into this messiness. But I also feel like my messiness is when I'm most creative. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I will refer to it as my creative clutter. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I think that there's something about having everything that I'm kind of working on right now, right? So I got a stack of books here, everything that I kind of have on my mind at any particular time, just having it out and having it in a place where I can kind of see it, it keeps it at the forefront of my mind. And so, uh, so I think that that's important and that's just something about me. Um, and then the, the second part of that prompt says, how do you fall apart? And that made me think very metaphorically about myself and my name, Autumn, which I spell a little bit differently. I spell it with two M's, but I've always uh, connected metaphorically to the season autumn, right? So how do you fall apart? Thinking about all the trees dropping all of their leaves <laughs> in autumn, kind of falling apart, right? Um, seemed sort of apt, seemed sort of fun, right? So that's why I ended up picking that one as my first. And of course, the community piece, because I love working with all of you so much. And I've worked on so many projects that have a basis in community with all of you. And this idea of belonging, now connecting back to the disintegration and the messy part of that and how messy community can be and how fostering mm -hmm. the sense of community or fostering the sense of belonging is not easy, <laughs> right? Because all of us are so different. All of us are so, uh, we've got so many different kind of things going on about what makes us feel, belong what makes us feel like we're a part of something, what makes us feel like we belong in a specific space. And uh, this of course is going back to the intentionally equitable hospitality kind of work I've done with all of you at different stages. Um, and it also reminded me of my work with DigSys. Right. And uh, thinking about digital citizenship and how we are, um, how do we connect online and how do we build, what are our rights and responsibilities in online spaces, but also who belongs in online spaces and who does not is always been a big part of that work for me because um, for all of community, um, I think that there is something to be said for the fact that uh there's there's lines and there's boundaries that are drawn through that work and uh kind of creating safe spaces and brave spaces is important as well so i've got about 30 seconds left but i think that that is an encapsulation of two of the ones that kind of stood out to me and maybe gives you a little bit of a taste of my personality and how i think about those things okay thank you thank you all for doing this um and staying extra time to do it. Um, I just I just want to get your reflections on how you feel about this structure, how you might use it in class, what did it enable, how would you do it differently? And I'm just going to make oh. a comment that people watching cannot see. Which, which is that you, you, you didn't were, do yours, Meha. No, I'm the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it just feels wrong. <laughs> no, but gonna be, the video is going to be really long if I did that. Um, so it's usually in groups of three. So we're, there were four of you. It'll be really long. Because like, you know, imagine doing it in class and how much time it would take if you did larger groups. It would take mm -hmm. up a lot of class time and be less intimate, I guess, the larger the, the group of people doing it. Um, now, I know you all know each other quite well. So like sort of try to step back and imagine if this was questions that you had to answer with complete strangers. And if you're an undergrad, for example, how you'd feel about that. But I'm just going to comment that we've been responding to each other in the chat, which we weren't supposed to do. <laughs> um, but it's really difficult not to respond. And this is one of the things that made me uncomfortable the first time I did the structure is that I know I'm not supposed to respond. So I tried to do with my facial expressions and do lots of thumbs up and, you know, that kind of thing to just let the person know that I'm listening to them. But um, when I first, the first time I did it, I realized that each of us, as we were responding, would say like one thing about the person before us, but that was not part of the structure. Um, but we never have to follow the structure exactly how it is, but it's always interesting to reflect on that. Laura, were you going to say something? That, that's exactly what I was thinking about, because I'm very like Zoom impaired, and so I haven't been in the chat. But for each person, I was thinking there was something I connected really strongly with something they said. So if we were to like go around afterwards, it's it's actually a cool feeling to realize that to each person, there's something that really stuck with me that I could thank them for that. So, you know, I like that idea of saying something about the person who came before you, but also just maybe going around at the end and, and thanking each person for something they said that 
you really connected with because that, I mean, yeah, you know, we all know each other, but I felt like I, I heard and learned new things too, even from people that I know. So this was really cool. I agree with Laura's point that um, it almost seems like there should be a synthetic moment afterwards where we acknowledge mm -hmm. each other's generosity. Mm -hmm. I also am hesitant to say this because I love, I loved this personally, but I do think this would be a kind of high risk context for under, uh, young people who are just getting to mm -hmm. know each other in a context which they might not be already established a sense of trust. So for instance, I would use this 100% like right away with those MA thesis students that I mentioned in my own reflection, the ones that are continuing with their second phase of it in the springtime. But I would not use this with an undergraduate course that I'm teaching in the fall where I'm meeting them for the first time and it's a totally different context because I think it would make them um, I just need to uh, establish a sense of um, trust and care, and that doesn't come overnight before mm -hmm. I feel I can ask them to um, engage with this in a truly thoughtful way. There's ways to go about it. We could answer these questions without bringing our full selves to them as well, just sort mm -hmm. of intellectualizing it a little bit, but in a thoughtful way, you know, and, and people can do that for sure. But I think it's powerful when people bring their soul to the question, not just their head. And so I'm not sure about this one for out the gate kind of work. I think this is for an established community to work through some of the things that they're, they're um, trusting each other on. Well, I could see it just a little bit later in the semester even. Um, now I only teach grad students and so um, I don't have that that large class younger population in mind, so my my classes are pretty small. Um, but I can see that usually I do do in one of the courses I teach an activity about immunity to change that gets very personal at about week three, um, and they can do it then. But I don't think I agree with me. I I don't know that they could do it at week one because they haven't done enough. Um, of that community getting to know each other stuff to be able to be vulnerable um, with each other. But also they have to have trust with the instructor. So they have to know that they can trust me. Um, and I don't know that they would get that on day one. And thinking about it in terms of as a teacher, I think it might be useful for me to delimit the questions within the classroom. You know, so to get them to focus their reflections on what is community in a classroom or what is belonging in a classroom or what is heresy in a classroom. And that way, it, it, they could see it as contributing to the classroom we're trying to build together. Because um, I know I would, I would be fascinated to find out what students say makes them feel like there's belonging in a classroom or or, or what's lost, or I don't remember all the structures. I'm not, the structures looked really cool and I'd like to learn more about them, but I think it would be cool to apply them specifically to what classrooms are and what they're for. I, so I had mentioned in the chat that I like the idea of reintroducing yourself throughout a class, having students reintroduce themselves throughout a class um, because you're growing and you're changing throughout this class as well. So every time you come to it, you're a little bit different. And then Rebecca said that she actually has her students do this. So maybe I'll let her talk about it a little bit. Yeah, um, I teach 100% online um, with synchronous sessions. Um, I used to only do three a semester, but now um, for some of my courses, I'm doing them pretty much weekly. Um, but even with the weekly ones, I have my students reintroduce themselves every week. Um, we play a little game where um, you get to call on the next person when you're finished. So when you're finished, you decide who's gonna go next and we just pass it around and everybody, I keep track and make sure everyone gets a chance. But I ask them um, in the introduction, something slightly different every week. So we start with, you know, name and location and maybe something about with something behind you in your screen. Um, but we then move on to, you know, what you like and dislike about teamwork or whatever, depending on what the theme of the week is. Mm 
Um, but I do explicitly have them reintroduce every week because it takes a long time to put faces to names and to remember where people are from and those details. And everybody needs that reinforcement. And so once you hear it enough times, then it starts to click, but there's no way it's going to click after the first time. <laughs> Um, and I find that, that that does go a long way to helping build that sense of community in the classroom. That's something and I struggle how neat. I'm sorry, Laura, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say my classes are so big that the, the, you know, they're not giant big, but they're like around 40 students, 45 students, that um, the way I have them reintroduce every week is in the sense that I randomize who is interacting with whom. Uh, during the week and they read each other's introduction blog posts over and over again, you know, different people reading them. And that's how do you something... randomize? How do you randomize? Oh, randomizers. I, um, uh, I you're either... talking asynchronous randomization, right? Right. What it is, is I build a, a, a randomizer that's got all the class blogs in it. And so the idea is that you spin the randomizer and, it pops up two blogs for you during the week. And if you're one of the ones that pops oh. up, I have them spin it. Is this in your RSS aggregator or is this like, I know WordPress has it. I don't know, but you no. don't use WordPress. So I'm trying to figure This is a tool that one of my students built for me back in 2005. I paid him and I can't remember a few thousand dollars to build me this tool. It's the best investment that I've ever made. And I did a huge presentation on it for domains. So I'll send you that link, Maha, where I explain. Can we put it in? Oh, the sure. Resources? It's like other people. Yeah, I, use it? I'm a total believer in randomizers for like everything, basically, because especially in the big class, <laughs> what are you going to do? Right? I mean, because it, it's, you, you can't plan everything. But the power of random means everybody does eventually meet everybody else. It just takes a while. So yeah, that's so cool. And then no, Zoom is good. No, at Zoom, Zoom like breakout that? rooms are not good at random. Unfortunately, they they will do the first one nicely. And then when you have them to reshuffle, you will find that two out of the three people, if there are three people will be in the same room the second time. Yeah. And it doesn't. Oh. Yeah. You so it, 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 it doing it though. No, nah, it's not that bad. It does happen. It happens time. a lot. We use it quite a bit and it happens <laughs> a lot. Because you have small classes, but if you have like 100 people, it wouldn't be a problem. It's just no, even with, even I've done it even with large groups because they did it at one of the conferences I went to for their uh, speed dating kind of thing. Um, and it was the same thing. I ended up, you know, they had 200 people and I ended up in three in with the same person in two out of the three breakouts that we did. Like it, it's it's like when you're happening. randomizing 200 people, that should not happen. It shouldn't keep, ha it's very low probability yeah. that it would happen. What's wrong with their algorithm? There's so, so much else wrong with them, but this was not one that I faced. Um, Autumn, you're, are you using the same randomizer that, uh, that Laura's? Laura helped me with it. Laura, Laura, I was like, hey, I know you do randomizers. I need a randomizer. How do I do this? She's got a great website and it, um, awesome. it is a little bit of JavaScript. And so I had to play around with how to make it work with the random, the set that I wanted. So you, uh, you needed to customize oh. it and play around with it a little bit. Oh gosh. But yeah, I do this uh, data privacy and identity uh, card game. It's an H5P and there's these different cards that you sort into different levels of privacy where you would be comfortable with. But then the second part of it is, okay, this is how you would feel comfortable about this. How would you feel with one of these identities? And I've got all these identities like, um, you know, you have a family member who's on a no-fly list or you've got a, uh, you're a Black Lives Matter organizer or something like that. And so you spin the randomizer and you get a new element of identity. I always say it's an element of identity, not a whole identity because of everybody is, mul we're all multiplicities, right? Um, so you get a new element of identity and then go back to the way that you sorted the cards and think, would I still be comfortable <laughs> with the way that I sorted these oh, cards cool. if I had this different element to my identity? I remember this now, Autumn, This because you set this up a while ago, right? Yeah. I set this up for DPL, uh, so it was probably August or something like that, but I mm -hmm. DM'd you and I was like, I know you do some stuff with randomizers. Yeah. What do I do? And she was great. She had all the stuff that I needed. <laughs> 
I've been doing these randomizers forever and I'm glad to actually build one for someone or to show you how to build your own. I did a tarot deck one for auto. Okay. With oh, really? Two different so you guys, can we do, can we do a different video just about the randomizer thing? On oh, another day? I would love to show people how it works because it's amazingly easy and powerful at the same time. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Let's do that one separately because I think people who see it, who aren't very into that kind of thing might need someone to show them how it works and how to mm -hmm. make it work. Um, is there anything else anyone would like to share just before we end this video about the thick greetings, not about the randomizer. We'll do another one about the randomizer. Okay. Thank you so much for doing the thick greetings with me. Um, and I, I sort of see where you're coming from in terms of like, for undergrads in the beginning, it might be difficult. But as like Laura was saying and Autumn was saying in the chat, you could use different prompts that mm -hmm. are less tricky or more related to the class where it doesn't feel like it has to get too personal. But I also agree that it's when it gets really personal that it becomes really valuable. So it's, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a tricky thing. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop this recording.